So I spent some time getting my course platform deployed out to a VPS, and I wanted to kind of walk you through the approach that I took. I didn't really spend a lot of time automating some stuff. I just wanted to get something out there really quick. And I figured, hey, let's just share this information with you all in case you decide that you want to follow something kind of similar. So we're going to diagram this out. Pretend this is you, and you want to access this domain of beginnerreactchallenges.webdevcody.com. What happens is when you load up your browser, that is going to first go to a record that's set up in Namecheap. That's where I bought the domain webdevcody. And I set up an NS rewrite. So basically there's like NS records that you can point to other places if you want to basically allow other DNS providers to control that domain in a sense. So when you make a request, Cloudflare is actually what's going to handle your domains and your subdomains that you can point them to different IP address or different services using A records, right? So behind the scenes, I have a record in Cloudflare that says beginnerreactchallenges.webdefcody.com, and that is an A record. Now, A record is typically used to point a domain or a subdomain to a IP address. When you create a VPS, you're going to get an IP address, which is what I have right here. And inside that VPS, the way I have this application hosted is I am using Docker Compose and a Docker daemon to basically spin up three different things. I have a caddy server spun up, and that's going to automatically set up the HTTPS certificates so that a user can actually have their traffic encrypted. And caddy acts as a reverse proxy. So if you go and look at this caddy file that's in my project, I'm basically saying for this domain, go ahead and forward all traffic to a container called WDC Tanstack Starter Kit App Port 3000. Okay, so this is going to direct all the traffic from this domain to a service with this name. Okay, so over here I have another service, uh, which is basically running my Tanstack server on port 3000 where all the traffic is gonna redirect to. And then this is hooking up to a Postgres database. Now I also have a volume mount on here. So this Postgres database is actually stored in a volume mount so that if I were to tear down the database, it wouldn't actually delete all my data. This is how you can kind of do stuff in Docker. You can store stuff in a volume mount, and then later you can think back that up or whatever. So that's kind of how this is set up. And if you look at the Docker Compose file, so Docker Compose, I call it prod.yaml. This is what's defining these services to all spin up. So let's just go ahead and look at that Docker Compose.prod file. And I have three services. I have a Postgres service set up, um, which is using Postgres 7 as a container name. One thing I want to point out is that right now I have it to only allow traffic from locally inside the container, right? So this is the loopback address, meaning that the only thing that can access this Postgres database is stuff that's inside of the VPS itself, which is a little bit more secure than just making it publicly accessible. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but there's also ways that you can actually just make it so only certain containers in this Docker Compose file can access the database. But I did it this way because I want to be able to show you a tunnel that I can run on my machine to access the data uh, without having to like um, expose the database to the, the world, right? So anyway, here is the volume mount where I basically have volume mounts down here defined. I have one called Postgres, and that is where it's going to store all that data. So somewhere it's going to be persisted onto the VPS so that if these things were to crash or whatever, the data is not lost. I also have this image that's running. Uh, which is basically just going to build this Docker file. If you look at this, that is just grabbing this project, doing npm install, doing a run build to build up the Tanstack start server, and then it runs it. Okay, again, this is port 3000 where it's going to run this stuff. Um, and here I am making it publicly accessible. I, if I wanted to make that a little bit more secure, I think I could probably do the same thing, only allow this to be accessible from you know the local loopback. I think there's also a way to say expose. And you can do that, and I think that'll also secure it. But I was doing some debugging, so I wanted to make it uh, publicly accessible. Anyway, there's a volume mount here as well. Because when a user uploads the course videos, I need to store that somewhere. So technically, there's also another volume mount for the videos that this thing has access to, and it's storing all the videos inside of this volume mount. So then finally, we have Caddy. Like I said, it's a reverse proxy. It sits in front of my service, and it's going to allow that HTTPS traffic to go through. And that needs to load in a caddy file, which I kind of showed you already. That's the configuration for like telling it what to redirect what ports to, what subdomains to, and whatnot. And then uh, that also takes in a, uh, a volume out so it knows where to store some of the stuff. And then I have a dependency graph set up. We don't want to run caddy until the service is running. So now let's move on to how do I actually deploy this? Right now I'm manually doing it. So I'll just SSH into the machine and I will just do a git clone on the repo. 
and then I do a Docker Compose up, I believe. I, if I look over here, I do believe I have a update shell script, which I've been running. Basically just runs as Docker Compose, and it points to that prod YAML, and it's going to run it, which is going to build my TanStack container image. It's going to spin up my Postgres database, and it spins up uh, Caddy. So whenever I want to push new changes, I literally just SSH into the machine manually. I do a git pull in the directory, and then I run this update command. There are ways to automate it. I just haven't done it yet. I mean, obviously I could hook this up in the GitHub Actions. I could just write one command I could run for my laptop if I wanted to automatically get that all deployed out. There's also something called Docker Stack, which I think I've already made a video about, which you can use to kind of deploy things to a remote VPS. You just have to like set up some keys and it'll deploy your Docker Compose file out to that VPS. But I had just been having a little bit of fun doing it the old fashioned manual way. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Probably adding a GitHub action to automate all this stuff would probably be the next step. So the next thing I want to talk about is the tunnel. When I want to access the data in my database, for, so for example, if I go ahead and create segments, or if I wanted to like mark a user as an admin or give them premium, how do I do that? Because right now the Postgres database isn't exposed to the internet. So like I cannot get into this Postgres database even if I have the password and the username and all this other stuff. So it turns out there's something called a tunnel that you can run. So here's the command. Basically, I'm mapping port 5435 on my laptop, and I want to map that to the Postgres database that's running inside of that VPS. This is an environment variable so that you guys can't see it, but I have on my bash profile like the IP to my VPS. And so I just basically source that, or when I open up a new terminal, I can just run this tunnel command, and then automatically I get this tunnel that's set up. So here is a tunnel. It's already set up. But once you run this, you can actually load up your favorite Postgres database tool. For example, I'm using Table Plus, and I can just say localhost, and I can put in that port that I talked about, the 351. You put in your user for the Postgres database, you put in your database name, and you put in your password. So now I can go ahead and connect, and that is going to connect to that remote VPS. Again, this is not localhost, although it says local, this is actually on the remote VPS. And so I can like look at the users over here. And you'll see that I have WebDiv Cody uh, is the only user. And if I were to switch them to not be the admin, let's just go ahead and save them back to false and save that. And then I refresh this page. Notice that all of my little buttons go away. So this is all live, but I have access to the database, which is pretty nice. So if you ever want to like debug, doing something like that is probably something good you should do. You should learn about VPSs and tunnels because you don't want to expose your database to the world. Now, granted, on the VPS itself, you should probably still have firewall rules set up so that you never accidentally expose your, you know, your service that's running on your VPS with this port because you could potentially misconfigure it and then accidentally expose it to the world. And then if someone gets your password, they could try to log in, right? Um, some other cool stuff is this .env file command. So when I spin up this database, you can say env underscore file and you can point it to one on your machine. Uh, if I were to go ahead and just do an ls here, You'll see I have the project, but then there's a, a, a .env file, which is right here. So I have .env Postgres. This is holding my Postgres password and my, I think my username or something. So I don't have to actually like hard code credentials in this Docker Compose file. I can just have it load in a .env file. Same thing with this one over here. My TanStack service is loading in that one, which has like my Stripe configuration, my Google authentication, uh, keys and whatnot. So that's how I'm kind of doing it. Again, this is a kind of a hacky approach. And honestly, on a more like serious project, I would probably not be hosting on a VPS and doing all this stuff manually. I'd probably be using something on AWS and probably using like AWS Secrets Manager and stuff like that. But again, for a small side project, if you want to save money and you just want this to be as simple as possible, sometimes just doing it manually, it might take you a little bit of time to learn it. But to run the steps yourself, I mean, it takes you like what? And then obviously if you learn bash, you can write a command to automate anything that you want from your laptop to the VPS. I will say I need to clean up this project structure. I like just having random bash scripts here in this project is probably not the best, but yeah, I hope you guys learned something by watching this. So I finally have this thing deployed out. I only have two videos up here. I, I wouldn't recommend going to the site and trying to actually buy anything because I don't think I have Stripe set up properly. Um, so I might actually need to turn this off after I publish this video and get it set up for real in case people want to buy this course. This is the same course I have on Gumroad. Remember that Gumroad course with like the 20 practice React challenges? I'm trying to move them all to my own course platform 
for a variety of reasons. One, just for fun, but also because Gumroad charges like 10%. And if I were to host this and do this myself through Stripe, I think I only get charged like 3.5% and then like a, a flat fee on sales. Like a, I think it's like 50 cents or something. So in the long run, I can make the course cheaper for you all because I won't be losing so much of a cut. But I will lose some of the benefits of Gumroad, which is like the ability to give coupon codes and refunds. I'd have to figure out a system myself to be able to do that um, through Stripe. I haven't figured that out yet and I haven't even looked into it, but I'm sure it's not too hard to just change the product pricing to be something lower and just swap out the price ID in my code base. Yeah, a lot of information in this video. Hope you guys uh, followed along and learned something. But um, yeah, I guess leave a comment if you think this is a cool approach. Leave a comment if you think this is a terrible approach. Leave a comment if there's a different way you would have done anything with this setup. And finally, I do have a Discord channel. You guys can join my Discord if you want to find a place to kind of talk with me or just other developers. Maybe you have questions and you need help with something, join the Discord. Maybe we'll help you out, maybe we won't. Have a good day. Happy coding.